I want to begin by telling you a story about a man that we will call Average Joe. Uh, Average Joe wakes up every morning, goes through his routine, gets into his car, and heads to his average job. As he drives his way into his average job, Average Joe listens to the same podcast and radio station that he always does, and he thinks about the things that have to get done uh, for the day in his work. As he makes his way into his average job, Average Joe sits at his average desk, and he answers emails, makes some phone calls, does a hefty load of administrative work, sits through a handful of meetings, and calls it a day, makes his way back home. As he makes his way back home, he wonders, is this all there is? What is my work really contributing to anything? I'm not a doctor saving lives every day. I'm not an amazing entrepreneur creating amazing technology for the betterment of society. Average Joe is just average. If you would ask Average Joe what he enjoys about his work, he might be able to tell you a few things. He'd probably have a lot more to say if you asked him what he doesn't like about his work. The reality is Average Joe is just living for the weekend and for his next vacation. His work is a means to a paycheck. His, means is a work to, or is a, his work is a means to one day no longer having to work anymore. Some of you may be here this morning feeling much like Average Joe on any given Monday through Friday. You wonder to yourself, what is my job really contributing to anything? I'm just living for the weekend. Some of you may be retired here, and as you look back through the careers that you've had in your life, you often question, did my work make any difference? We can be discouraged in our work. Paul is here to tell us in Colossians chapter 3 verses 22 through chapter 4 verse 1 that no matter what our work is, whether we are employed, whether we are retired and doing volunteer work, whether we are stay-at-home moms doing the all-important hard work of caring for the family 24-7, whatever our work is, our work is far more significant in God's eyes than we might ever realize. Our work is dignified and honored by the Lord, and it is an integral part of our following Jesus. Colossians 3, as we've been studying it, has shown what Christian identity is. And Paul is helping us to see in these verses that our work is an important aspect of our Christian identity. And as he writes in these verses, he is going to show us that our work is worship that serves Jesus and pays off in eternity. Our work is worship that serves Jesus and pays off in eternity. Let's read what Paul has for us in our work, starting in verse 22 of chapter 3. He writes and he says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. As we take a look at these verses, I think it's important for us to remember the context in which Paul is writing, that he is not just writing commands uh, to obey, But he is actually laying out for us in these past few weeks of Colossians 3 what missional living looks like in the gospel, living out the gospel in society, that our Christian identity has a radical impact on the world around us. People will see the difference that the gospel makes on a life. 
by the way that we relate to one another in the area of marriage when we looked at his commands for husbands and wives, in the areas of our families with parents and children, and even here, excuse me, <clears throat> even here in the area of our work, that the gospel will be put on display through the way that we interact with the work that God has given us to do. He's writing to the Colossians in a specific context, and it may actually surprise us to see in these verses that he is addressing bondservants and masters, literally slaves and masters. Uh, the New Testament, we have to remember, was written to real people in real time and real circumstances. The ancient city of Colossae that Paul was writing to was a city that was fraught with the reality of slavery. Many Christians in the city of Colossae would themselves have been slaves, and actually some of them would have been masters of slaves. If you've ever read the New Testament letter of Philemon tucked in the back of the New Testament, uh, you'll know that Philemon was a slave master of a slave named on Onesimus. And we're actually pretty sure that both of those individuals fellowshiped together in the Colossian church that Paul is writing to here. So how do we understand what Paul is addressing when he addresses slaves and their masters? Because in our minds, when we think slavery, we think our context in the American history of the slave trade, the evil uh, atrocity of the slave trade. Paul is addressing something very different, and we have to understand the historical context to see its relevance for our work today. Ancient slavery was very different from the American slave trade. First of all, it was not based on ethnicity. So there weren't particular ethnicities that were being enslaved, like in the history of our nation with the African-American community. And secondly, slaves mostly consisted of prisoners of war. You have to remember the Roman Empire was conquering cities all over the place, and as they conquered a city, there were always those who were not sympathetic to the Roman Empire. What they would do is they would enslave those individuals until they had thoroughly Romanized them to make them responsible citizens of Roman society. Just for instance, nearly 80 to 90 percent of the population of ancient Rome were slaves. So if you would have been born into the ancient Roman world, most likely you would have been a slave due to the uh, conquering of different cities. But also, slavery was something that was often entered into voluntarily. So poorer folks, uh, in order to pay a debt or to secure their own welfare, would sell themselves into the servitude of wealthier families so that their basic needs could be supplied by serving wealthy families. And I think most importantly in understanding the difference between the slave trade and the slavery in the ancient world is that there was well-defined and protected laws for the rights of slaves. Uh, those were seriously kept and there was always an end date in mind for the liberty of a slave. So Paul is addressing something very different in when he addresses slaves and masters than originally comes into our mind. And what Paul is seeking to do is to help believers understand how they live out their freedom in Christ in a culture where slavery existed. How can they be salt and light and witnesses for the gospel in a fallen, corrupted society? I was really helped by a comment uh, by Mark Johnston this week on this text. He said this, it is likely that Paul deliberately reaches for this example at the extreme end of the spectrum of relationships, slave to masters, on the premise that if God's grace and, and salvation can transform relationships in that sphere, then it could do so in every other sphere of relationships as well. Faith in Christ frees us from enslavement to sin in order that we might be the best servants to society. It frees us from enslavement to sin in order that we might be the best servants in society. 
So taking that particular historical background, what are the abiding principles that God gives us for our work that we might be gospel witnesses in the work that we do? First, Paul shows us in verse 22 that faith in Christ turns our work into worship. Faith in Christ turns our work into worship. What's the first command he gives us in verse 22? Take a look at it. Verse 22, bond servants or employees, we could say, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, or we could say your higher ops, your bosses. We are to obey our bosses in everything. In other words, we are to make our bosses' jobs as easy as possible by being as agreeable as possible under the jurisdiction of God's word. So we as believers, as employees, we should not be marked by backtalking to our authorities. We should not be marked by gossip in the workplace. That there should be no incessant questioning and critiquing of every decision that our higher ups make. And what's the motive for the command? Because we are worshiping God with our work. Take a look at how he goes on in verse 22. Why do we obey them? Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. All of us know what it is, if we admit it, we know what it is to fake it till you make it when it comes to your relationship with your boss. We know if you treat the boss well, you schmooze him a little bit, you, things are going to go better for you. You're going to be able to climb the ranks of promotion and raises and climb the ranks in your job. We can have very selfish motives for the way that we treat our bosses with respect and kindness. Paul is piercing through that aspect of our selfishness to show us that we treat our bosses well, not for our own glory, but for the glory of God in the fear of him. After all, Jesus is our ultimate master, and he came down and served us in our rebellion, in our hatred, in our sinfulness. He was our servant. How could we not serve him in our work and worship him? Work, we're told from the very beginning of the Bible, is a wonderful gift from God that he gave to us intended for his glory. It's one way that we worship him. Remember the very beginning pages of the Bible? God makes Adam, and then in Genesis 2, where does he place Adam? We're told in verse 15, God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to keep it. Work was an aspect of the perfect paradise that God intended for us, that we find fulfillment in using our skills and abilities to work and to uh, glorify God in the work that we do. I think too often we sometimes speak of work as though it is a result of the fall, that if somehow, you know, Adam and, sin, uh, Adam and Eve had never sinned, then we wouldn't be working today. We'd just be all laying around and enjoying vacation 24-7. But that's not the case. Work is meant to be a fulfilling thing for us and to give us joy as an act of worship to God. However, the reality is that it is now marred with sin and it involves difficulties. For those of you here this morning, you read verse 22 and you say, but Adam, you have no idea about my boss. My theme song driving into work every day is take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. Uh, what, what do you do in difficult uh, areas of employment? I know some of your stories. I know that you find uh, it hard to engage with your job because of the people you work for or work with. I think verse 22 helps us to raise our eyes higher than just the people that we work for. Paul is helping us to see that God is the one who is ultimately employed you. Now, you may have sat down with someone and they conducted an interview and it was the boss who offered you the job, but it was the Lord in his kind providence who opened up the door of employment. The Lord showed you favor in the sight of your employer and he intentionally set you down where you are. 
It is him who you are to fear. See, we don't treat our bosses uh, just by how much we respect them. We treat them based on how we respect God. For those who face difficulty in the workplace, we have to go in with the prayerful attitude, accepting what Jesus told us on the Sermon on the Mount. What are we to do with people that we find it hard to get along with? He told us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Paul says in Romans 12, 18, a great work verse, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We have to trust God that the mistreatment that we face in work will one day be answered to by the Lord. Take a look at verse 25, for instance. Verse 25, he says, he gives us a promise for those who are mistreated in work, the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. We trust the Lord to make right the wrongs that are committed against us. It is our job to seek to be as loving and agreeable as possible. Each one of us, our work is not just work. It is worship if we belong to the Lord Jesus. Your job is an outreach ministry in and of itself. You know, we've got this big outreach event, the church-wide day of service coming up in just a couple weeks. We're going to be out in the community as Grace Church at Will Valley. But don't forget that every single day, you are doing outreach ministry in the job God has given you. you know, some, sometimes people ask me about our outreach ministry here at church. And because I'm a little naughty, I sometimes answer a little facetiously. And I'll say, well, you know, we've got an outreach ministry at A&A Auto. We have an outreach ministry in Penn Manor School District with some teachers there. We've got an outreach ministry at JK Mechanical. We've got an outreach ministry in landscaping crews all throughout the community because we have people who work in those places and they understand that they're representing Jesus with the work that we do. Faith in Christ turns our work into worship. And secondly, secondly, Paul shows us that faith in Christ changes the quality of our work. Faith in Christ changes the quality of our work. Take a look at verse 23. In verse 23, Paul tells us what, how we should do our work. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever we do, whether we're retired, whether it's volunteer work, or whether it's part-time or full-time employment, or just a full-time student, we do all of it for the Lord with great enthusiasm. We work heartily. That word that we have translated there for heartily, the Greek word literally is psyche. You bring your very psyche into your work. Give it your whole heart, your whole soul. Why? Because we're not just working for man, he says. We're working for the Lord. We should work with enthusiasm, with diligence, and with great joy. God has given us our work as a joy. The book of Ecclesiastes helps us to see how work is meant to be a joy. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 says, There is nothing better for a person than that he eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? I'll never forget a great quote by a pastor I admire named Ray Ortland. He looks a little bit like the father in seventh heaven, doesn't he? Do you remember that old show from the 90s? He looks like the dad. Anyway, he says this great quote. He says, the world works hard in order to play hard. But Christians play hard in order to work hard. All the world has to live for is the weekend. But we as Christians know the great joy of working as God intended us. What did he give us? Not six days of rest and one day of work. What was the order? Six days of work and one day of rest. 
We were meant to find joy and fulfillment in the work that we do. Now, if we're going to keep the quality of our work in such a way that we are honoring the Lord and worshiping him with it, if we're going to preserve the quality of our work, two extremes need to be avoided that the scripture warns us about. First of all, we need to avoid workaholism, uh, overwork, being a workaholic, where all that we ever do is work, 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 work. The book of Ecclesiastes, again, tells us, shows us this sad portrait of a man who gave himself to his career and made it all, all about his career, all his life, and he ultimately missed out on the greater things. In Ecclesiastes 4, he says, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? I know there are many here at Grace, you work very hard and you love the job that you're in. Be sure that your identity is fundamentally in Jesus and not in your work. That when people ask, so tell me a little bit about yourself, the first knee-jerk reaction in your heart is to tell them, I'm a follower of Christ, and not, I do so and so, and I work here and there. And, but that Christ is the fundamental aspect of who you are. It brings equilibrium to your work. I think, especially you young dads in particular, in the season where your children need you most, be sure that your family understands that they matter to you way more than your paycheck and the quota that you're trying to reach for that month. I think of that Eagle song where it says you can spend all your time making money or you can spend all your love making time. Be sure that your identity is in Christ and you're not a workaholic. But on the other extreme, we have to avoid the danger of laziness, laziness. The scriptures have some really, really funny verses to say about the, the sluggard, the lazy person. In Proverbs, uh, we're, we're introduced to the lazy guy in the morning in his bed, and he can only move uh, two ways. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. He's there, he's got the, the right side of the bed and the left side of the bed, and that's about all the movement that he can get. And in the next verse, where finally he's out of the bed by some amazing miracle of God, and he's before his cereal bowl for the morning for his breakfast, and what do we find? The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out even to bring it back to his mouth. He just can't get the spoon even up there to eat the cereal. He's that lazy. Now, that's funny, but the scriptures are very serious about the sober realities of laziness. That's why we had for our scripture reading from 2 Thessalonians the, the command, he who is not willing to work will not eat. And Paul goes as far in 1 Timothy to say, if anyone does not provide for his family through work, especially the members of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We should have a willingness to work. But even if we are working, we should be sure, as Paul says there in verse 23, that we are doing it for the Lord and not for men, that we're not doing a lazy job in the work that he has given us to do. Solomon shows us what we should be like in our workplace by pointing to something as simple as the ants that God created. He says, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, without having a boss, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food for harvest. We should bring new innovation to the work that we do. We should seek to be a servant in the work that we do, bring new ideas, put our best foot forward, that everyone in our workplace can see a difference in the way that we work because we're not just working for man, but we are seeking to glorify Jesus through the work that we do. That goes even for you employers here at Grace, those of you who are in high places of management. Take a look at what Paul has for you there in chapter 4, verse 1. He says to you, masters, bosses, managers, whatever you may be, treat your bond servants justly 
and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven, that you provide fair wages, that you provide uh, a, a fair workload to every employee under you, that you give proper guidance to everyone who has tasks to do that you give them, uh, to treat them fairly, to show them perfect courtesy, to be quick to listen to their criticism of you with humility, and even to defend them from mistreatment in the workplace. Why? Because though you are a master, you are under the ultimate master, the Lord Jesus. You're working for him, even as you have others who are working for you. Faith in Christ changes the quality of our work. Our quality of work will either help or hinder our example and our witness in the workplace. Let's see to it that our work is a help to the witness opportunities that we have in our workplace. That we give the first fruits of our work as an act of worship to the Lord every day. Thanking him for the opportunity and the health even to be able to work, for the skills and abilities he's given us to exercise in our work or in our volunteer work or whatever it is, even thanking him for the problems that we come into in the day, that recognizing that those problems that we face in the workplace are actually a gift from the Lord. They don't feel like a gift from the Lord, but they're a small gift that he has bestowed specifically upon you as a royal child of the king so that you can actually help someone that day and that you can bring a little light into the dark world. Well, lastly, lastly, faith in Christ, Paul says, looks beyond temporary wealth to eternal reward. Faith in Christ looks beyond temporary wealth to eternal reward. We're living in a culture that tells us to chase the dollar. And there is a whole lot of the love of money in our hearts than any of us would care to realize. Uh, it's just a part of our culture. It's the air that we breathe. We are a money-oriented culture. What is the antidote to being free from the love of money? Paul gives it to us in verse 24. Take a look at verse 24. He says, work hard is for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Paul there is helping us to see that we shouldn't just be living for the weekly paycheck, but we should be living for the ultimate payday. Not just the weekly paycheck, but the eternal payday that awaits us in eternity. Each one of us as believers, when we come and meet our Savior, we are told and promised that he will reward us for the work that we have done in the flesh on earth to bring him glory and to help others around us. It is a straightforward promise. He will see to it that we are well supplied for the work that we have done for his sake in our lifetime. I wonder what that means for you here this morning who may be someone who is seeking God. Uh, for the person here this morning who is investigating Jesus, you wouldn't necessarily call yourself a Christian, but you are seeking to understand truth. I wonder, is this life all that you're working for? What will you be living for when you retire? What will be the meaning of life and retirement for you? What hope are you taking with you for when life is over and you die and you meet the God who created you? How can you be sure that what you're doing now actually matters and reverberates down into eternity? Paul is helping us to see that we were created to work not just for this life, but to work for the Savior who made us, the Lord Jesus. And he is so kind in his grace and mercy that though we are sinners, 
He has come in the flesh to bear our sins on his cross. That great problem of death that I am sure you are thinking through and that you are worried about, and that's always kind of in the back of your mind, especially as you think about the uncertainty of life, even in the last 24 hours in the, in the events that unfolded in our nation. What hope do you have for when you say goodbye to this life? Jesus is the one who rose from the dead and conquered death for our sake. In order to be sure that you are saved, he asks you to trust in his saving work, trust in him as savior, and then to live with him and for him as Lord. You can work and have purpose in your life beyond this world. You can have work that matters for eternity and becomes kingdom work by representing him as a follower of Jesus. And for those of us who are following Jesus, do you see how this eternal reward that we have coming our way actually frees us to give of our weekly paycheck for the sake of his kingdom work, knowing that he is going to see that we are fully supplied in eternity? Understanding the eternal reward awaiting us frees us with the things that we have today to be able to contribute to his kingdom and supply his Friends, I know that there are people here this morning, you uh, struggle to enjoy the work that you have. Uh, You wish that your job helped people more directly. Uh, You wish that your job was more overtly Christian ministry and not just out in the secular field. But Paul is helping us to see in verse 24, I would encourage you to underline every single word of the second sentence in verse 24. Here is the reality of your work. You are serving the Lord Jesus. Don't underestimate how God is using you no matter where you are and what you're doing to impact his kingdom. Your work is worship that serves Jesus and will pay off in eternity. I want to end by uh, quoting from Joel Devinney, one of my mentors. Uh, When he came to speak at the men's retreat a few years back, he preached on this very text. He did much better than I did. And he ended with a story about how every single one of our jobs are sacred work that God dignifies and honors. And that every single one of our jobs is utilized to answer someone's prayer when they pray give us this day our daily bread. And here's what he had to say. He said, every time that someone prays, give us this day our daily bread, God inevitably is using your work in some way to answer that prayer. He uses the work of those who made and manufactured and sell sell the farm equipment to the farmer who reaps the wheat, He uses the farmer and everyone who works for him, who grows the wheat and harvests the wheat. He uses everyone who is employed in the trucking company to take that wheat to the factory that will turn it into flour, and then will take the flour and take it to the grocer who will sell it. He uses everyone who is working in the grocery stores who stock and sell the flour and the other ingredients that people need to make the bread. And he uses every single company that pays the families who go to that grocery store in order to be able to have the means to buy that loaf of bread. Every time someone prays, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, he is using your work in some way to provide for someone's needs. We don't have to be average Joe with an average job. Jesus magnifies our work. We are children of the king doing kingdom work. As we go back out into the workplace tomorrow, let's seek to be salt and light. Let's work as to the Lord and not to men, speaking the words of the gospel, knowing that we are serving Jesus and worshiping him through the work that he has given us to do. Let's pray.